Hello and welcome to HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. I'm Mabel Jong. Today, we're so pleased to be joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, to discuss the latest on COVID-19. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Fauci. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It's great to see you. Uh, now, you've likely seen the images of packed airports as people ignored the call not to travel or gather during the holiday. What will the consequences of those actions be? And why are people still not getting the message of how dangerous the risks are? Well, the concern that we have, Mabel, is that we are already in uh, a, an unprecedented surge in the sense of the slope of the increase in cases where we're now more than 20 days in a row of over 100,000 cases per day. We range uh, 1,000 or more deaths per day, sometimes close to 1,500 or more. We have over 80,000 hospitalizations. We now have a quarter of a million deaths, more than that, and over 12 million infections. That is a bad place to be for two reasons. One, in and of itself, it's alarming when you have that degree of acceleration of cases, but also, it gets even worse as we get in deeper into the colder seasons of the late fall and the early winter when most things are done indoors as opposed to outdoors. And then there's the point that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the understandable need to get together with family and friends, usually in settings that are indoor with people sitting around a table with you know, 15, 20 guests. And that's the reason why the CDC was saying and I agree that although this is a is such a lovely and and looked forward to tradition of getting together for Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. this is going to be a risk to keep the surge going. In fact, even to accelerate the surge of cases. So mm -hmm. although it's so difficult not to do these things that are so natural to our mm -hmm. society, sure. you know, I've asked just the family units to just take a moment and just think about the risk benefit uh, calculation that you make. If you have elderly individuals or people with underlying conditions, although you may feel well, you feel that everyone looks and feels well, what we're dealing with now, Mabel, is that the silence spread in the community from people who don't have any symptoms, who understandably and intuitively would let their guard down and say, well, let's just get together. You know, we're there, we're eating, we're drinking, we're not wearing a mask. That's a risky situation. So hopefully we don't see a kind of an acceleration of the surge, but I fear that we will, but that won't be noticed until two or three weeks down the line, which would make it even more difficult because that's when we get into the Christmas season. Right. So this is unfortunately a very, very difficult time where people are gonna to have to evaluate the risk that they're willing to put themselves and their family through. Now, have people still been infected even if they were doing all the right things? Masking, distancing, good hygiene? That can happen, but that is much, much more diminished when people abide by the fundamental public health measures that we talk about, the uniform wearing of masks, as you said, the physical distancing, the avoiding crowds in congregate settings, particularly indoors, doing things to the extent possible given the constraints of the weather, outdoors more than indoors and washing hands frequently. You will see people that would get infected, but we know that in those areas, those states, those counties and those where you can compare one group that implemented public health measures and another group that did not, you could see a clear difference in the infection. So although you will have infections that get through those kinds of things, but as a whole picture, clearly we know that the implementation of those public health measures significantly diminishes the risk of acquiring infection or transmitting infection. Now, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do right now, today, at the national level to address this health crisis? Well, you know, I don't think there really is a national uh, a, a magic wand to do that. But the, one of the things that I would do and would hope for is that we would see, particularly now in this precarious situation that we're in, a more uniform abiding to the public health measures. 
you know, one of the beauties of this country, it's that United States of America and the federalist system has the states having a degree of independence to do the things that they want to do with often the central government pulling back and not telling them what to do. I would like to see more of a uniformity of response as we get through this, because one of the important things, Mabel, is that help is on the way. Mm -hmm. If we could all pull together and do these mitigation efforts, these public health measures that we talk about so often and double down on them, because we know that we're going to start getting doses of vaccine towards the middle and end of December for the higher risk groups. And as we get into the first quarter of 2021, January, February, March, more and more people will get vaccinated. So we're going to have the help that we need to put an end to this. But what we want to do now is use that, that realization that help is on the way to have us double down to make sure that we don't get infected or spread infected before we get the full benefit of the vaccines which are on their way. It should be more of an incentive rather than saying, well, vaccines are coming. I don't think I can do anything about this. Why don't I just do what I want to do? I think that ignores the fact and ignores the numbers that we're seeing, the difficult situation that we're in. So, you know, that's a two-part story. We're in very serious, challenging times, but we do have the capability of blunting that acceleration, of having it turn around and having the slope go down, particularly with the help of vaccines. So that's why we're almost pleading with people to just do those simple things. Now, when you say blunting, do you mean getting everyone across the United States on the same page, which we still aren't on right yeah. now? Is that what you mean? And and I want to get back to those vaccines. Um, what percentage do you think of the American population needs to be vaccinated for this pandemic to be effectively over? And is that possible if most people say they're too scared to get it? Well, I'd like to explain to the people who are too scared to get it. It's understandable that people might be concerned when there's something new that's put in front of them. But let me answer your first question and then get back to the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. We would need, I would imagine, we don't have the exact number, but somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of the people to get vaccinated in order to get a real umbrella of protection over the community the community being the United States of America. And hopefully that can get done worldwide so that we globally crush this outbreak. But when you get that much protection, the virus really has no place to go. You know, that's what we mean by herd immunity. The, the protection of the whole group prevents the virus and it just dies away and dies down. I'm not sure we can eradicate it, but we can very come close to eliminating it if we all pull together. Now, Let's get to the vaccine. And I think maybe because of the divisiveness in our society and some of the mixed signals that we might get from Washington, if you look at how the vaccine is decided to be safe and effective, what do you do? What kind of processes do you go through? I think what people need to understand that the speed of it is a reflection of the extraordinarily exquisite breathtaking in some respects, advances in science, which is allowing us to do things in weeks to months that formerly took years without compromising safety and without compromising scientific integrity. We went from identifying the virus in January to having safe and efficacious vaccines in the middle and end of November ready to be distributed in December. That's an extraordinary feat that's been accomplished without sacrificing safety or scientific integrity. Then others ask, well, are we sure that this is safe and efficacious or are they putting something over on us? Is it political pressure or it's companies trying to make a lot of money? Well, mm -hmm. take a look at what the process is. The right. process is that the trials involved tens and tens of thousands of people. And the determination of whether it was safe and effective is done by an independent body, an independent group of vaccinologists, scientists, immunologists, virologists, statisticians, 
who are independent of the federal government and independent of the company, who examine the data carefully and make a determination if the candidate is safe and efficacious. Once they do that, then mm -hmm. the company looks at the data because the company is not involved in this. You separate mm -hmm. them so that this data and safety monitoring board does it independently. Then the company examines the data and presents it to the FDA and the career scientists, the professionals, not the politicians, the professionals look at the data and work with their advisory committee on immunization practices, which is the CDC, who is the one that uses that particular committee to decide how a vaccine is being distributed. But before they do that, what the FDA does is they get their own committee, which is the advice, which is a committee that's the vaccines and related biological products advisory committee. It's mm -hmm. called VERPAC. So the CD, the FDA works with the VERPAC committee and says, we're going to do an EUA. We're going to have an emergency use authorization. As soon as that happens, the CDC with that advisory committee that I mentioned to you a moment ago, the advisory committee on immunization practices makes a determination of how you're going to distribute the vaccine. So you have an independent data and safety monitoring board that determines if it's safe and effective. You have the career scientists at the FDA. You have their committee, which is an advisory committee to say whether you're gonna use an emergency use authorization. And then you have the CDC comes in and with the help of their committee, which is the advisory committee on immunization practices to determine who should get it and what priority. So there are so many levels of independence and transparency there that people should feel confident, I do, that yeah. when a vaccine is determined to be safe and effective, when my turn comes, according to the uh, prioritization of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the CDC, then in fact, I will take the vaccine. And I certainly would advise my family and friends when their turn comes to take the vaccine. Okay, and I know we're pressed for time, but I do want to hear about your Thanksgiving plans, but I've got to ask you this, for our healthcare workers, what's your message to and about them? Are they again experiencing a shortage of PPE uh, burnout from being on the front lines? Do they know better how to treat their COVID patients now? Well, a couple of questions, Mabel. First, mm -hmm. yes, they absolutely know how better to treat their patients, absolutely. Um, number two, they should not be running out of PPE, but if they are, they should immediately get back to FEMA and, and first of all, go locally to their own state because there may be PPE there that they don't even know about. And if they don't have enough, their governor should appeal to the central federal government about getting PPE that they don't have. But according to what we're hearing at the level of the task force, there should be enough PPE for people. But we understand sometimes that you think they have enough and they don't. If they don't, they should make that known so we can get it to them. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Okay. And so what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Well, I'm being very careful. I, I'm having a quiet dinner with my wife. We have three adult daughters who are at different parts of the country, and they have made a determination on their own that as much as they would love to come and as much as I adore them, would love to see them, they don't want to endanger me. They don't want me as an elderly person to possibly get exposed because they're going to have to travel through airports. They're going to have to do the kind of interaction before they get here. They want to be perfectly safe. So they're saying, let's worry about holidays in the future and just call a timeout for this one. And that was their decision. Sounds like a good one, a good plan. Well, thank you, Dr. Fauci. Stay well. It's so great to see you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And thank you for joining us for this session of HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. For more health news, remember to check us out at live.healthday.com, on our Facebook page at Health Day News, and on Twitter at Health Day Tweets. I'm Mabel Jong. Have a safe and healthy holiday.